Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond Recovery. I'm your host, Matt. My guest today is Pradeep Sangha. He's an award-winning author, entrepreneur, speaker, and podcaster. The most recent book is called The Complete Man, and he is my guest today. Pradeep, how are you today? Hey, Matt. I'm pretty doing pretty awesome. How about yourself? Really good, really good. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, so you got a lot going on for you, and... Um, yeah, I, want to, I just want to get into. I want to get into your book. I want to get into, uh, you know, what you're what you're doing for speaking, and just your life story, man. I'd love to give you just the open forum here at the beginning to talk a little bit about um, your life story and what brought you into what you're doing today, the whole entrepreneur thing. Just yeah, a little bit about you. Sure. So I I guess it's it's really relevant to the conversation because a lot of the work that I do is a result of someone in my life actually suffering from addiction. And, and so that has led me to this path today where if, if I talk about what we do today is we work with entrepreneurs, CEOs, executives, leadership teams, managers, basically helping them perform better in business, helping them grow their business, but also helping them perform better in their personal lives. So we created a one-stop shop for people and 90% of our, our clients are actually men uh, and and. I guess it's for a reason because we tend to cater specifically to men, uh, but we do work with women, but we help them be successful in all areas of their life. And that's essentially what the book, The Complete Man is about. It's about performance, achievement, and fulfillment in every area of your life, not just in business, but also in your personal life, as a father, as a community man, and as a person, as a living person with a soul and a being. So that, that was the purpose of the book. But this all really started from my childhood. Uh, my parents immigrated from India in the early 70s. And they didn't have any Western education. They just worked hard and, and they were doing manual labor until they had enough money and, and saved up. They, they were actually working on an orchard and eventually bought their own orchard. And I grew up on an orchard. My brother and I, ever since I can recall, were on an orchard. My parents used to put us in an apple bin when they would be apple picking because that was our playpen. And it was an awesome lifestyle. It wasn't an easy lifestyle because we did a lot of work in the orchard, but it was a very mindful lifestyle as well. So if we talk about addiction and one of the core aspects of being able to get through it and overcome it, mindfulness is a big aspect. I can We can talk about that as well because that was a big part of my life growing up. Uh, and it, one of the core aspects that we use when we work with individuals. But what what my life was really about in the early stages was uh, obviously being a kid, but and in the family business, so learning about family and, and business. And my dad, especially being a business owner and an entrepreneur, uh, he, was a, he was a great dad from the perspective of it wasn't that he was a, never around. He was always there for us. He was always available. He would do anything for us. We knew that he loved us more than anything, but he also struggled. He struggled with alcoholism. He was a heavy drinker and he was also a big guy. And when he would drink past his limits, being a physically big man and me being a young kid, it was very scary because he had a very loud voice as well. And something in his life caused him to let's just say, be triggered. So I think something in his childhood was traumatizing. And I, I think it was a result of my grandfather being in the Indian military for 30 plus years and not being around for him as much. And that I am sure has impacted him. And But what ended up happening was he struggled with alcoholism. And for the longest time, I was I was the only one in the household that could help him calm down. My brother was too young. My mom just triggered him. Other people in the family triggered him. In-laws definitely triggered him. Um, but I was one that would calm him down uh, ever since I was young, uh, probably seven or eight, or maybe even younger, I think. And I would even put him to bed. Like that was his soothing mechanism was me being there for him. And maybe it was a sense that maybe because he felt like he was being loved or whatever it was, um, he, or and not being judged perhaps, but he, uh, what ended up happening was he drank to the point. He also had diabetes drank to the point where at one particular time, he almost lost his, uh, ability to walk because his feet, right. The nerves in your feet, when you have diabetes eventually die. 
And it was extremely painful for him. And the doctor said, the specialist said, hey, look, you're not going to regain this. If you continue to go, you're going to be in a wheelchair. And that would have been extremely emotionally, uh, mentally painful for my dad because he was a guy that just worked physically on the orchard all the time. Mm. But somehow, even the specialist said, hey, look, you're not going to recover from this because nerves in your feet don't recover. They die and they're dead permanently. But somehow he regained, regained it. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know what happened, but he did. But he still, after that, continued to drink mm. because he went back into his old patterns. And then he had a minor heart attack. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit later, his goal was to hit 65 because that is a milestone for someone coming from another country because that's the pension age, right? right. You came to a country and now the government is, is taking care of you after you've paid all your dues. Uh, and at 64 and a half, he died of a sudden heart attack. He died working. He died alone. It was a series of events. I, I talk about this in my book where my mom is forever traumatized as a result mm. because there was all the what ifs because my dad and my mom typically go to the temple on Sundays, but that was one day my mom didn't. She was upset at him because he drank the night before. And she came home and she thought he was still working because the machinery was on mm. and she went out and started working in the orchard. And then after a while, she's like, he just didn't come in for lunch. That's not like him because my dad had a big appetite and she turned around and she didn't notice that about 20 feet behind her, he was laying there, passed away. And so that was a pivotal moment for me in my life uh, because we were already doing a lot of work with men. Uh, we do a lot of work with men who have addiction challenges, probably about 25 to 40% of men that we work with have addiction. We don't work with them specifically on addiction. It just so happens that they have it. Right. And that was a message from my dad saying, you got to keep going. You got to go harder. You got to go faster. You got to help more men out there. You got to, you got to help people, um, indirectly with their addiction. And so that's, that's what we do. Uh, it's a big part of our things where we help men from a leadership perspective, be better business leaders, husbands, fathers, which helps them through addiction. Or once they come out on the other side of dealing with addiction, it helps them gain more purpose in life, more meaning in, in life so that they don't fall back into their old ways. Mm. So that is a big reason why I do what I do because I grew up with a father dealing with addiction. I studied neuroscience and neuropsychology at a very young age because of my dad, at a very young age, I had to start predicting his behavior. So I knew when he was going to drink to the point where I think I knew he was going to drink before he did. And I would go to my mom. He's going to drink tonight. My mom's like, no, he promised he wouldn't. And he wow. and would drink because I could see the behavior throughout the day, what hmm. he was acting like, if something triggered him or his facial expressions. Um, and so that gave me a skill. And I built on that skill over the years where we have a very strong skill set and experience and research. Now we actually have a research team that works with people in, in, from a neuroscience and psychology perspective. So we have that backing when we work with men and that experience. So now we are very good at working with men and helping them be successful, but also overcome challenges. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, the one thing, so many things, so, you know, we could circle back to you. There's a lot to, to jump off. So thank you for sharing your story. It's uh, you know, that's, quite quite an amazing story and there's a lot of very uh like you say pivotal moments that i could see where uh, would uh direct your behavior as they have or, or promoted your behavior the way they have you know the first thing that comes to mind is this whole idea of like the complete man and just like you know so it's like body mind spirit and it's like your business it's your family it's the way you're showing up for yourself which i think a lot of self-help is often like niched into just one of the three categories, but you're purposely intentionally going for that full bodied approach, which that jumped out to me right away, which is really cool. Was it always like that? Or where did you start off with like a certain, okay, we're just going to be working as business coaches mm -hmm. or was that up in your mind? No, like I, I, I want this complete was, what was your vision like initially with this, uh, the way you're helping people? Well, it, it didn't really start off with this way because when we, I came out of the corporate world, and started our advisory firm, it was really focused on business. Mm. But I, throughout my years, for 30 plus years, I've been doing two things, focusing on human potential and personal performance and development, right? The mind, body, spirit, and business. So for my entire life, I've been doing that because I realized at a very early stage in life, that if I focus on myself, 
I can perform better in all areas of my life. I can be better at academics. I can be better in sports. I can be better in business eventually or whatever I got into from a career perspective. So I started that in my teens at a very young age. Wow. Yeah. I started to study people like Einstein and, and Leonardo da Vinci and all these amazing inventors. And, and at that time, mainly men because women weren't necessarily allowed to, right? That was kind of frowned, uh, frowned upon. But I learned their ways early on. And it was something that was very core was a lot of it had to do with them as individuals, right? Their passion, their purpose, their internal state. I was also very fortunate that I had a grandfather that immigrated over as well, my dad's dad. And he had a very unique background. He was in the Indian military for 30 plus years. So he had the side of him that was very disciplined and he also fought in two wars. And on the flip side, he was a very spiritual man. So my great grandfather was a spiritual teacher in, in India for almost six decades. So my grandfather was spiritual and he taught me so many different things about life from the side of war to spirituality, to mindfulness, meditation. Like he, he gave me this full spectrum of life that I wouldn't have seen if, if he wasn't around. So at 17, at 16, I started to manage employees. At 17, I became a personal trainer. And so I've always had it in me to want to help other people. And I think maybe because of my dad and, and part of it being a calling. And so at 17, when I was helping people trying to transform their bodies, what I realized at that stage was I could give them a perfect plan. Well, maybe not perfect, right? But a good plan, right? A good plan for them to improve their body transformation, their weight, get stronger, increase muscle. But that didn't mean they would do it. Mm. There, was, there was very little correlation with that technical part and them actually executing. Interesting. So I was wondering, like, why the heck? And that was very correlated with my dad. Why do people do what they do? And why do they yeah. not do what they should be doing? Right. And so I studied more about psychology and neuroscience and how people work and belief systems and stories and identity and all these subliminal aspects of how we operate as human beings, because it's not just science. There's a lot of spirituality behind it, psychology behind it. Right. Yeah. And so that triggered me to understand that, Hey, look, I'll have more success if I can actually help that person be more motivated, driven, have better belief systems and feel better about themselves before they actually start doing it because they're more likely to actually do it then. So that's what transformed my approach when I was in the business sector, because when I was working with people in business, something just got triggered because they wouldn't necessarily execute on the business plan. And so I went back to those days and said, okay, now let's bring this into it. And that's what really accelerated our business because it was almost like I was a little bit, I'm going to say thick skulled at that time. It didn't really hit me at first. Because I was like, I'm just going to focus on business. I don't want to go into this realm of personal development or life coaching or anything like that. Because, you know, people think that's hokey pokey and mm -hmm. those people aren't skilled as much. And that was just my stereotype, right? It's just right. a bunch of motivational talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't want to be seen in that manner. I wanted to be the best expert in business. But then the doors just kept opening and kept saying, you got to follow this path. And that's what I did. And here we are today where we are developing expertise in both areas, right? Personal yeah. development and business development or growth. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question. I apologize for the long winded answer. No, it definitely does. You know, and it, one thing that jumped out uh, when we were talking about, like some of the people that are motivators or you looked up to when you're even at a very young age, like Einstein, Da Vinci. It's like, to me, I immediately think of, they are like complete men. Like they have both sides of the brain. It's like the whole brain. They're very scientific, but not a lot of people know about Einstein. He was a wonderful violinist from what I hear as well. Right. So he has like the musician, like the spiritual side to him as well. So it's such a wonderful, uh, you know, mind, science mind, like both sides of the brain, same with Leonardo da Vinci. So, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm hearing about. That's like the way that you're bringing that together and your, your method of training and realizing the, you can have one without the other, but man, it's so much more powerful and potent to have it all together. So that's really cool. Um, even just like this, the stories of, um, you know, from you as a child, like putting, helping put your dad to bed at such an early age, it feels like you've taken on, I imagine you took on a lot of this, like responsibilities that, uh, from a very early age and, um, you know, having some of these mentors that, that you're in your family that showed you both sides of like a spiritual side, you talk about the mindfulness 
And then you talk about just like the rigidity and like the binary language and pressure language that potentially come with like discipline and, and being in the military. So I can really see how the origins uh, it came. And it's very, very interesting story. Let's get into the mindfulness because, you know, that's mm -hmm. a, a big part of my show and the listenership. And um, it's going to segue fairly nicely into what my next question is. But yeah, the mindfulness, like how is that? shown up what kind of a practice is it for you and how do you go about like coaching it because that can be a very challenging thing for people even to do, like these days like meditation can be like Ugh. you know like you're talking about the the uh, whatever it gets dismissed as a hairy fairy or whatever mm -hmm. not for me i don't know how to do it am i doing it right what was your origin story with uh, mindfulness and, and how it came to you know what you're doing to today as well so it again i think i tripped upon a lot of things at a younger age and I experienced them. So I was a very spiritual child because of our upbringing. And as a result of that, I also believe that I, tr I just, my, my grandfather would teach me meditation, but not to the highest degree, for example, it wasn't like I was sitting there and he was being like meditate for hours. I just saw him meditate and be like, okay, this is kind of cool. And then he would explain it and I would do it. And I came across mindfulness and meditation through that. And also things like lucid dreaming. And what I realized was there's a connection between all of these aspects that our mind is extremely powerful. And I would go into states of dreaming. I would meditate either because there's walking meditation, for example. And I, as a kid, as part of, I believe, a coping mechanism for the challenges in our family because of my dad, I would walk around for hours after school. And our house was situated where you could walk around the kitchen, the living room, the family room, and just do a circle to the point where years later, when I went back to the house, because we still owned it, I noticed and we hadn't changed a carpet that there was a track that was actually uh, put into the carpet. Wow. So I literally would do that for hours and go into a state of meditation. Hmm. And that's what really helped me because what I also noticed it was a combination of things. So I'm just going to bring it all together. Yeah. There was that. There was being in the orchard on the weekends and even evenings where some days I just I was just by myself the entire day, not even a single human being around, just nature. So I fell in love with trees. I fell in love with nature. I was there present with my mind 24-7. And I can tell you that if you don't know how to train your mind by being in nature for an entire day by yourself, you're going to go crazy. But I absolutely loved it because I was in tune with my mind. And so these things just came together. And I also, in school, had this gift as a result of mindfulness and meditation and, and being out in the orchard. And I don't say it as a gift, as in gifted. I came upon a technique and a tactic through mindfulness and meditation where I could excel in academics what ended up happening was in grade 10, my teacher came to me and said, how come you were not at the award ceremony last night? I said, why would I be? And my teacher said, you're going to need a wheelbarrow because you won every single award in the school. And that kind of hit me and I, I wasn't aware of it, but I realized that maybe my test scores were a lot higher than other kids. And then that followed throughout high school and I graduated at the top of high school and people would call me the smart guy, the geek, and I could basically do a lot of things in second year university we were studying for a biology test and one of my peers was we were going back and forth opening the textbook and quizzing each other and one of my peers basically opened up a page and opened up the next page and looked at me and said pretty you have this entire book memorized word for word you know that's not normal right and at that point that's when it really hit me that all of these techniques and tactics that I were using from a mindfulness and meditation perspective helped me excel in academics and in sports. So how, why is that so important? If we take a look at the core aspect of meditation and mindfulness, I, to, for me, those are two separate practices. I don't teach them myself. I have, I have professionals that come in to teach that because I, I teach other things. But for me, they're different. Mindfulness is a way of being present. And there's different ways of being present. It could be meditation. It could be just sitting there and breathing. It could be doing whatever it is. So mindfulness is being present, being alert, aware of the present moment. Meditation can either, you can be in a state of being fully aware or not even aware at all. You're completely gone. Mm. 
like you're in some other dimension, you're in some other world, or you are void of all thought completely. And some may say that that is mindfulness because being present, being completely aware, being completely whole is nothing. So to me, from a traditional perspective, they are two separate things. Yeah. But from, or sorry, from a Western perspective, but right. you could say from an Eastern perspective, a traditional perspective, they kind of fall into together because everything is nothing and nothing is everything. Yeah. So that's where mindfulness comes in. And a lot of people, are, the reason why they have addictions, a lot of reasons why they have challenges in life is because they are, have a challenge being fully present. Mm. They have a challenge dealing with their own thoughts. And they want to tune their own thoughts out. That's why a lot of people drink is because they it's this layer of responsibility. It's this layer of not being genuine that they can remove and just feel like themselves. It's because they haven't learned how to be fully mindful. And if you're fully mindful, you can remove those layers yourself without any substance. It's not easy. It requires training. It is a practice. It's an exercise. And just like any other exercise, it gets better over time. And there will be a moment for those that say, well, I can't sit down because we get this all the time. We can't sit down for five minutes and not think about anything. I can't meditate. Well, then do, do a mindfulness practice again, which I separate. Mindfulness just could be sitting there just for one minute and just doing deep breathing. And then you can slowly increase that to a minute and a half or two minutes and just focus on that. Whereas meditation is traditionally, you know, people think of meditation, they're closing their eyes, cross-legged, in a cave, <laughs> yeah. right? Monk-like. <laughs> right. Um, but true meditation, if you, again, correlate between mindfulness and meditation, meditation is is really around to not know thyself, be familiar with yourself. And that really is, if you, it, again, there's a misconception that to be enlightened, you have to meditate, which is crossing your legs and closing your eyes and doing this for hours. No. True meditation is about living your life in the present moment, being fully aware and alert, which is exactly what mindfulness is. But you can be aware. If you talk to people that have done this and really understand this meditation, mindfulness practices, they will tell you that it really is a mindfulness practice in the traditional sense of meditation is just a practice. You still have to apply that throughout your life and be fully present. That's true meditation, when you can walk around and engage in a conversation fully with someone else and be fully present with them right. and connect, connect with them at an energetic level. When you're doing work, you're fully engaged in work rather than thinking about what you need to do next. So that's where there's a misconception about meditation and mindfulness and what that actually means. Yeah, that's, I, I love that. I love the way that you, you broke all that down. I mean, first thing that jumps, jumps out at me is like, you know, when I practice mindfulness or meditation, uh, it often clashed very much so with the, with when I'm working. And what I mean by that is when I get into my tasks, I generally found, uh, you know, as soon as I cast some awareness on it, that I was going into a mild stress response. I would do the fight, flight, or freeze. I would do freeze. And I would mm. try and task hop. I would project what's going to happen in a couple hours from now. I'd go, okay, I have this call. I'd get out of my own head. I would, I would take on too much. So I'd have this divergent energy, which is very much to me, the opposite of mindfulness. And now I'm able to catch myself of, okay, I'm doing it again. Right. But it's mm -hmm. this, oh my goodness. And I can hold that for you know a few minutes at a time now, but that's after 25 years of doing this fragmented, almost that opposite side of, of mindfulness, like being very fragmented and, and being pulled from past experience. Oh, I shouldn't have said that to that person just now. Oh, and I, two hours from now, I got a call. Oh, uh, that emotion's coming up again. I'm going to check my Instagram, push that feeling mm -hmm. back down. So that is, to me is such a, uh, versus after my workday is done and I'll go and, and practice meditation. So how are you able to combine those two worlds in what you're talking about with the complete man? Like how can you promote mindfulness and yet still be like super successful at like business where to me, I'm still have this collapse distinction of like, achiever energy uh like sh almost shortness of breath do go go to me that just i don't know like achievement and and hard work and everything is like does not have it's not in the same neighborhood as mindfulness <laughs> you know what i mean how, how, how do you resolve that in your program so typically it's science 
and that's why we use a lot of science because it's easier for guys to comprehend. And I'm saying this for women's benefit as well, but again, most of our um, clients are, are men, but this applies to women as well. Uh, science has really advanced over the last 10 years, especially with brain scans and like uh, such as fMRI technology, where they can distinguish now what activities uh, are active within the brain, what parts of the brain. So here's what they've shown now that eight to 12 minutes of daily meditation actually changes the structure of your brain. So now science is saying meditation actually does something and does something fabulous. And there's scientific proof behind it. So that's not even a question mark anymore. There's been enough studies to say that is scientifically proven. So that's how we really talk about it. But we also have a formula. So this is why Again, because I have a science background I, and a, a very systematic background, we we basically decoded uh, so many aspects of life and performance and fulfillment because it's easier for people to understand. That's why when I talk about motivational speaking, I actually dislike it. When someone comes to me and says, can you do a motivational talk? I'd be, no, thanks. Please don't come to me. That's not what I do. I will tell them and show them the system to actually improve their business or life. That's what it is. It's a system. So we've created a system for people to perform better and be more fulfilled in life. Here's a connection. There's three aspects, three frameworks that I use in the complete man performance framework, achievement framework, and fulfillment framework. They are in a circle. Most people want to perform. Here's what you need to do. If you perform, you should be achieving as well, which means that if you're going to play basketball and you're in the finals, everybody wants to win the championship, right? And how do you feel when you don't win the championship? You come in second, third, you feel pretty crappy, right? And so it's about performance, performing at your best, your optimal level. But then it's also about achievement, achieving your goals. But here's where most people miss out, the fulfillment aspect. And if you don't focus on the fulfillment aspect, meaning am I really happy with what I'm doing? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? Yes, I hit my goals, but is this actually meaningful? You're going to be, you're going to have less fuel to actually perform better again. So it's a complete cycle in a circle. So most people bounce between performance and achievement, performance, achievement, eventually what happens is they burn out, they fizzle out, or they lack passion and drive and desire in their life. And they're in their sixties or seventies with millions of dollars. And they're wondering why they're not happy. Now yeah. money can't buy them happiness. And they're even more screwed because they have all the money in the world and they still can't be happy. So that's why fulfillment is so important. So coming back to what you were saying, that's why being the complete man, we focus on the internal aspect of an individual. And in our system that we use, one of the core aspects, the last act aspect, there's five aspects, right? The last one is what we call active sustainability, mm. which means that if you are to perform at a high level, you have to be able to do that for a longer period of time. There's no point in performing at a high level for six months and then burning out. Boom. We've seen guys do that all the time. They hit what we call the brick wall. They have a heart attack. They have a stroke, anxiety, panic attacks, broken marriages, whatever it is, that brick wall, it's hard to recover once you hit it. A lot of guys haven't recovered, both physically, emotionally, or mentally. Mm. So stop yourself before you do or learn how to slow down before you hit the brick wall and know how to leap over it. And that is what we call active sustainability. And a big part of that is mindfulness. I would say mindfulness is, again, I separate them in meditation. Mindfulness exercises have been shown now scientifically, the number one thing to improve someone's recovery period and help them over stress. And this is with high stress jobs, such as military, such as firemen, police officers. The number one thing that they've shown and to increase performance is mindfulness practices. Hmm. So if you want to see why would a business professional do it? Well, take a look at what Navy SEALs do. Yeah. It's a big part of their practice. And so if you want to be the Navy SEAL in the business world, you need to do mindfulness practices. So high performance, a, a big component of that is mindfulness. And when we show men how they can perform better as a result of that, they're all on board because they're like, I want to perform better. So let me try this out. Yeah, right. I can see, a, you know, it's and there's been such a development over or an acceptance uh, in a, of the, the whole mindfulness thing, especially in Western culture. I'd say over the last 
10 years, but spe especially even three to five, I'm sure you can speak on it uh, more accurately than I can. But do you still get some people that have a little bit of resistance because technically it's not like a, you know, masculine energy or, you know what I mean? Like it, they don't, they don't perceive it as such. Do you still get that? Or is it because you can prove these results? They're just like, okay, I, you know, it might not be my thing, but I will, I'm willing to try it because of these results that you're able to get. Yeah, I think we, we don't always get a lot of resistance. The biggest challenge that we come across or individuals have is they, they've tried it and they can't sit still with themselves. Ah, that okay. is the bigger thing because they think they're doing it wrong. Right. They think that because they can't sit there for a minute after you know attempting it five or six times, that it's not for them. And that is, a, again, a complete misconception because just like any practice, it takes time. And I can guarantee every single individual out there, every single one, and I will put my, like, I would stake my house on it, is that if you continue to do the practice and not give up, at one point in time, you are going to feel something that is going to change your life forever. There's going to be a moment where you feel complete release of tension mm. or energy or stress or responsibility. And it's going to feel like some people call it bliss. Some people call it emptiness, but it's like, you're not stressed anymore. You don't have that un underlying stress. You're just yourself. You get to be right again. Mindfulness is about being not doing it's about being. And once someone feels that they get hooked. Mm, I'll bet. I'll bet. Even just talking about it, like I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it starting to show up in my body here. How much, how important is breath? Like when you're talking about just mindfulness, because <laughs> to me, again, I, I'll flash back to when I, I when I'm in that work mode or whatnot. It's like that shallow chest breathing. I've done it so much in my life, and now it's just probably the last year or so. I've been very working on the awareness of my breath, and man, does it, you know, a, f a few good abdomen breaths will just bring me right back down. So yeah, what can you say about what, the importance of breath, and is that you know part of your program? How does that show up? Yeah, so just like I would say, if anybody wants to get fit, the first single most important thing that they have to do is exercise. You're not going to get fit without exercise. You're not going to be healthy without exercise, right? That is a core aspect. One of the most common things between exercise, between yoga practices, between mindfulness practices, between meditation practices is the breath. So the breath is the most important thing. So if someone asked me this the other day, you know, Pradeep, can you break this all down for me? What is one thing that I can do today that can change how I operate? And I said, breathing. Wow. Yeah. Next day, he sent me an email. He's like, you're absolutely right. This changed my thing because he had some stressful client meetings. He's like, normally he comes out of there completely stressed. And he's like, he had a completely different emotional reaction and feeling after that. Wow. And so breathing is, is so important. A, biologically, we operate off of oxygen. So our cells need that. So many people are trained to breathe shallow. Deep breaths are very important. There's a direct correlation between shallow breaths and anxiety and nervousness mm. um, and, and stress and cortisol levels and deeper breaths and calmness, right? If you take a look, if you take deeper breaths, like I have this Fitbit on my watch and I always laugh with my wife because we have these conversations. When I practice my deep breathing, my heart rate just drops. Right. Boom. Yeah. And she's like, how are you doing that? I'm like, well, it's all breathing. Yeah. And so if you want to reduce your stress levels, your ability to react more effectively, think more clearly, breathing is the most important thing. It's also the core aspect of spiritual practices because that breath is energy intake and outtake. Yeah. It is a flow of energy throughout your body, throughout your cells. So there's a biological and a spiritual aspect as well. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk to that because it has made such a, a big difference in my life. So I wanted to hear what your, uh, your take was on it. And I, yeah, thanks for that. You know, I want to get into, you know, a bit of like the talking about like addiction, you know, why people have addictions. You mentioned 25 to 40% of your clients that you're working with. You're not necessarily looking for it, but it's showing up. It's coming to the surface. What in your opinion is, and this would be a, a pretty broad question, but take it as, take it wherever you want to go with it. What is addiction? Like what is, why does it show up in people's lives? What is it getting in the way of us expressing, you know, like what, what is, what is, through all your studies and different clients you've worked with, what have you found is like addiction? 
So from, from our experience and our research, and, and this isn't an area that we focus on particularly, but we do, again, work with a lot of people in it, is everybody has an addiction. That's how the brain is developed and, and actually is because it's all about dopamine and, and different like endorphins in, in, in your body that really create a chemical reaction. And once you get hooked on something, your brain wants more of it. Right. So that's essentially what addiction is. And everybody has an addiction. Some people have addiction to video games. Some people have addiction to sex. Some people alcohol, some people drugs, some people reading, whatever it is that turns a person's crank, they will get addicted to it. The question is, is that addiction empowering you or disempowering you? That is the question. And so if you're going to be addicted to something, which one of the biggest things that they've shown to overcome addiction is to fulfill it with something else, right? Change it get addicted to something else, right? You know, people who have alcoholism, for example, get addicted to working out or something else that can give your brain that high. And so it's important to do that because your brain will never sit there in a lull state. It wants that stimulation. That's what we are designed to do. Our, if, if you understand how the brain works, the number one thing that our brain is designed to do is move us, mm. which means that we have to be motivated to do something. Like it, it is actually trained to get us to move to be motivated to move our bodies because moving our bodies means that a our blood flow is circulating but b we're also seeking food we're seeking sex we're seeking all these kinds of things that's not going to come to us right we have to move towards it so that's where addiction is right it's a pull towards something that satisfies a feeling or an emotion um, or some bodily function so that's that's a that that's a breakdown of it from that perspective. So what I we talk about is there's other reasons why people get addicted. So that was a biological chemical reason, but some people get addicted because they're bored in life. Mm. Some people get addicted because they feel crappy about themselves. Some people get addicted because they don't feel good enough. Some people feel alone. Some people feel like they need to get back. They want to rebel against something. There's so many reasons why people feel addicted. Um or get into an addiction, right? And some people continue to do it because they want to feel guilty about something. Yeah. So there's there's a number of reasons, and they some of some people might find it strange, but it's not strange. These are natural reasons and natural things that cause people to be addicted. Like, why would someone want to be addicted to um, piss people off? There's people that drink. Because they know it's going to piss someone else. Like, that's what my dad used to do. My mom used to get on his case. He would drink more. Right. I'm going to show you. I'm going to keep drinking. Yeah. So there's there's many reasons why people get addicted. Yeah. That's a yeah, really interesting, uh, you know, observation or summary of it. I, two things that came up to me. So the first thing, because it does get mentioned in the in the addiction world, like specifically, there was a, like a support group that I, I was part of uh in my initial alcohol free stint that mentioned don't don't transfer the addiction uh right away because then you're not going to know why you had that addiction in the mm. first place now i completely went the exact way of what you were talking about literally exactly what you said i started going to the gym every day it was one of the things on my periphery i'm like you know when i stop drinking one day i'll start going to the gym right so when i stopped i'm like well i i guess i gotta like be a man of my word now so i started going to the gym every day i found like the brain chemistry and everything that was happening um was it was you know i, I was getting some fulfillment out of it and such so having said that i didn't ever circle back to why I had the addiction in the first place. So those emotions were coming up and I just found another thing to whoop, push them back down. And that led me to having a, a relapse and then basically trying this moderation thing. And, and here we are now. So I say that to say this, now I have gone in there and done the, the, uh, the inner work as far as like why I had this addiction in the first place. So it's kind of interesting because yeah, like I totally get both sides of what you're saying, but like, how does it show up for other people? Like, is, is there a, po a potential of just doing an addiction transfer and then they're good? Or does that sort of depend on like, is it an X factor of like perhaps a childhood trauma or something that they'd have to circle back to do some e deep inner work on that? Do you get what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, it yeah. feels like there's a triangle kind of going on there. Yeah. And so there's, there's a number of reasons why people get again into addiction. It's always something internal, but Every, each one of us has some kind of challenge from our childhood. And a lot of it's unconscious and we don't even know about it. And that affects how we think, we, what we believe in and how we act in our behavior. 
And that can impact our relationships. It can impact our performance at work. It can impact why we are do like, why do some people want to make a lot of money when they don't need to? Mm. Like, why, why do some people, if someone's making $10 million a year, why do they need to make a hundred million? <laughs> right. Is it really going to change their lifestyle that much for them? No, they're going to have more stress and they're going to, they're, you know, bigger challenges perhaps. So why do people do what they do? Because there's an underlying desire, motivation, belief or story that they have. And every one of us has to uncover that. Mm. What is our purpose? Why are we doing what we are doing? Whether it's in helping us or not helping us. That's, that's a core aspect. We have to peel back the layers. And that really comes down to our identity as well. Who are we? Who am I? And, or who do I want to be more importantly? Because a lot of people get addicted because they're not happy with who they are. So fundamentally, if we are happy with who we are, less likely to get addicted to a substance. That's Boom. from my, my personal experience in terms of working with, with mainly men. Yeah. There's some kind of unhappiness. Now there's a second aspect to that as well. The environment. Mm. There's something in the environment that is either triggering or enabling that behavior as well. And if you go back to that same environment and you are not strong enough to deal with it or change it or modify it, then you're going to get back or most like, or more likely to get back into that same pattern or routine. Yeah. So I always suggest people obviously get strong enough internally, but also take a look at their environment. If it's not conducive to actually getting past their addiction, they need to change it fast. So, and what can that look like? I mean, there's the obvious, like move out of the house you live in, you know, but you know, I, I, there's so many, to me, there's so many X factors that come up in there. Like if somebody's, you know, troubled for money, are they going to just pick up and move? You know, are you talking environment? It could be uh, who you're hanging out with, what places you're socializing with after work. Like, where does that show up? Cause like there's yeah. a, many different elements of environment. Yeah. That's a uh, really good question. Environment could be your workplace, right? could be the friends you hang out with, just like you said. It could be the, the home that you have, the house that you have. It could be the city that you live in. You know, we're working with one gentleman right now who's got an addiction problem, and the city that he lives in is, it's a party town. It's easy to get into trouble if you want to. And so that environment is just enabling him. Right. So my recommendation to him was pick up your family and move. You're going to have a higher chance of actually recovering and getting past this and saving your life and saving your family. Now, some people be like, uh, you know, I don't know. I can't do it. Is your life worth it? Right? Because most people know if they continue with the addiction, it's not going to be a happy path, right? It's not going to be a happy ending. So is your life worth it? And sometimes it requires tough decisions. Mm -hmm. No one wants to make those tough decisions, but sometimes they are required. That is what leads to recovery as well, because recovery is tough. But once people realize that they were able to overcome it, they become so much more powerful and they're less likely to, because they're like, I'm strong enough to not even go back to the old habits. Yeah. I don't need to. Right. And they're happier with themselves. Anybody that has addiction, they're not happy with themselves. No one is proud of it. Right. Most people try to hide it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally true. Totally true. You know, we, we touched on a little bit on just the word identities coming up. And I want to get into that because, you know, getting through this, like your, your, your hero's journey of, of coming out the other side of addiction recovery, man, I just remember what it was like for me, a lot of questioning my identity, who I had been before and who I was coming out the other side. And it really, it was challenging. I'm like, who actually am I? Because I know who I was before and I didn't, I don't relate to that person anymore. So for identity for me it was like the last three years has been a big deep dive into what are my core values? And before I'm like, well, this is going to be easy. I know what they are. But realistically, when I started putting them up to the light and going, okay, this, I don't think this is even mine. This is like my dad's core value that I've just carried, or this is my mom's, or this is what I think society thinks that I should have as a core value. So I got, I lost place of like what I, you know, I lost touch with my identity, quote unquote. So for me, it's, um, yeah, it's been part of a big part of my journey. And I can know there's going to be a lot of the listeners that are going through that early stage of recovery or, you know, coming out the other side. So 
it's an interesting concept. I'd like to, to hear what your take is on, on identity, what makes it up, you know, um, how, sure. how, how, how does it relate with, with ego too? Because, you know, what, what, like, is it, is it, are they one in the same? Are they on the flip side of different coins? So we'll bring that in as part two, but just identity sure. to start. So maybe you're gonna have to remind me on the ego part um, when the time comes, but identity is very important. It's one of the first things that we tackle because the first element that we initiate, like I said, the five parts is what we call unwavering inspiration. If you have unwavering inspiration, that is the fuel. That's the fuel in the tank. You're more likely to make change. You're more likely to perform better, right? If you don't have that fuel, good luck. So we start there. And the first aspect of unwavering inspiration is identity. And there's a number of factors within that. And this will be very helpful for the listeners to pay attention to. I always recommend write this down. Within identity, you have elements such as what is your passion? And if you don't have a passion now, what did you think about when you were a kid? What did you always want to do? What do you want to do now that you never thought was possible? I talked to a gentleman the other day and he said, your book changed my life. I read it and I moved to a different country as a result of it wow. because I had a passion of living there and I just picked up my family and moved. So what is your passion? Then your passion will also leads to your purpose. Every person has to have a purpose or meaning in life. And it doesn't have to be grandiose, like save the environment or climate change. It could be as simple as I just want to be a good father, mm. or I just want to be a good human being, right? I want to help one person a day, whatever it is, you have to have a purpose. You also have to understand your power and your power is what are you good at? What are you strong at? What do you, what do you, because if you're doing something that you don't feel you're good at, eh, it's not very motivating. It's not very inspirational. Or what can you be good at? Mm. What skill do you want to develop? And call that your power because when you do more of the things that you are really good at, you get more inspired, mm -hmm. right? If you're playing golf and you're good at it, you're going to you're gonna want to play more golf. If you're crappy at it and continue to be crappy, you're going to fizzle out. So that's another element. Then you also have to see your personality. And this is a tricky one because a lot of people do personality tests and I'm not in favor of them. Because there's very few, there's personality traits, but tests category, categorize you. And that's a bad, bad result. Because now you think that's who you are. And you're more likely uh, to stay within that category. Yeah, your yeah. personality, I'm a firm believer from a spiritual perspective, you can change your personality. Mm -hmm. I used to be a shy kid. And I can now go in speaking events. I do tons of podcasts. I've written my book. Like I, I can get up on stage and talk to people about this. Because I developed that personality. Most people be like, I'm an introvert. I can't do that. No, you can change how you behave in your personality. What, what is your play? And when I say play, what, what can you play around with? And I'll use an example. People who are in work that are in a job that's very stringent and they don't have the ability to be creative or do different things or have leeway within it, autonomy within it it doesn't become playful. And if it's not playful, it becomes boring. And if it becomes boring or stress, then you're no, less likely to be motivated. Like, what do you enjoy doing in your life? Because that needs to be a core part of your identity. What is part of your play? So part of my play, for example, is I love the human mind. I love spirituality. I love all these aspects of relationships and people. So every day I'm putting together systems and I get to play around and say, okay, what if we try this? Or what do we try that? Let's see how that works. And it's fun. And then that leads to the next aspect, which is pleasure. What brings you pleasure? And I'm not talking about hedonic pleasure, right? I'm talking about pleasure in terms of, I actually did that. That was good. Whether it's working out, right? Either you're going to enjoy it while you're actually working out, or you're going to enjoy it after. And that is the key. If you do an activity and you don't feel pleasure after, that kind of gives you a sign that maybe that's not the right activity. Like if you go out and have a one night stand and you're feeling guilty about the next day, you're going to be like, yeah, maybe that's not the right thing to do, right? If you work out and you're not feeling pleasurable while you work out, at least after you feel good about yourself because you know that you worked out. Yeah, gotcha. So there's an aspect of pleasure after so that there's something to remember. Like it, it has to be, you got to maintain that level of not that level, but you, it should feel pleasurable after as well. So you should feel good about yourself. Then you also have things like pressure. 
and what I mean by that is social pr- pressure. Mm. Social pressure has a big, big impact on your identity. Just like you said, your dad, right? Mm-hmm. So what are the things that are putting pressure on you? I just came back from a four day hiatus, a reestablishment, a rebirth of myself for 2023. I do this so I can actually get away from my family and just put my plan together for 2023 and go back to who I, who am I? Who do I want to be? Because now I'm not thinking about what does my wife want me to be? What do my kids want me to be? What my, what does my mother-in-law want me to be? What does my mom want me, my clients? It's just me. What do I want myself to be? So I take all that pressure off and I say, what is actually legitimate pressure? Yes, I'm a husband. Yes, I'm a father. So that I have to take on. But all these other pressures, nah, I don't have to worry about them. Or I can reduce them or minimize them. So those are the aspects of, and 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 what, and then the other one is your what we call priority values, right? And you talked about that before. So p- your priority values are your top pri- like priority values. We have so many values, but the top five, like what do you really value? What do you make your decisions based on? Now a lot of people think they know what their values are, but they're when they write them down, and you match that with your behavior. Right. Not, you don't think your values, you do your values because values, you make your decisions based on your values and you act out the behavior based on your decisions. So if you want to know what your values are, just take a look at what you do throughout the day. Yeah. People say, yeah, I value health, but they eat a bunch of junk food. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so your values are determined by your actions, but that doesn't mean you can't change them because one of the core aspects of identity is who do you want to be? And what values do you need to have? So my values change yeah. every six months. I redo my values Cool. because I'm like, now this has to be more of a value here. I have to change things because when you have conflicting values or values that don't match what you want, that's tough. Sure. Cause now you're making decisions that are not in alignment with who you want to be or the goals that you have. Dude profound that's another p word for you profound yeah that was great so it, the eight p's do you call it that system i was i did yeah it, yeah it, yeah it, it, i yeah. love that so, I, I wrote that down that's good so then the second aspect is the ego aspect yeah yeah um and i want to make sure that we have time here so absolutely uh, yeah i i, I want to be respectful of your time we're coming up on an hour here so are you are you still good for a little I, i'm good for another here? 10 minutes yeah let's do it so, okay so <laughs> ego again a lot of people think ego is bad like they bash ego and ego for me and i'll explain it from my perspective and what i've learned from my spiritual learnings is ego is just a separation of meaning that you and i are separate right you're a separate human being i'm a separate human being you're matt i'm pradeep we have two separate egos in the spiritual realm we are still one in this physical realm we are separate based on the ego now is the ego bad It can be if I sit here and say, hey, Matt, I'm better than you. Or you sit there and say, hey, Pradeep, I'm better than you. That's when ego can actually take you down. Or you get so caught up in your ego that you lose sight of other things in your life. This happens a lot with people who make a lot of money, athletes, celebrities, because now their ego is who they are Mm. and they can't let go of it. Or if anything harms that ego or gets in that ego's way or threatens that ego, man, they fall apart. So ego is great because people like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, they had a high ego going into a basketball game. They went in and said, I'm better than you. Not necessarily as a human being, but as a basketball player. Ah, uh, yep. Right? Yeah. And it worked for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. So you can go into a specific discipline and say, I'm better than you at that and mentally think about it. You don't want to put the other person down unless you're playing psychological games like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan did. Yeah. And they were good at it. That's part of the reason why they won championships. It was a mind game. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have to know when that is taking control of you because you see a lot of athletes then eventually taking drugs or getting addicted and no, or they, when they stop playing, guess what? They no longer know that ego just, continues to try to fuel them and they they fizzle out or they take addiction or they do something stupid so when when your ego controls you that's when you got a problem so are they yeah i'm just i because the way you're speaking of ego 
does what happens is your identity essentially contracting like you're losing sight of who you are on an identity level and the, the ego is then taking over for it like are they kind of one in the same like is it a yin yang type situation with ego and identity in your opinion yeah because okay. it is it is an aspect ego is our physical manifestation in this world mm. but that's important because if i wasn't separate from you i would just be i wouldn't be what would i be Right, would I be right. sitting here on this podcast? No. Sure. Um, so sure. there has to be ego. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people have, again, misinterpreted what ego is. And people say ego is bad, right? And all these kinds of, there's even books about it, right? The yeah. ego is the enemy, yep. which is not the case, right? Yeah. It is the uncontrolled ego, right? The ego that controls you, Yes. that is the enemy. Ego is necessary. Ego right. is needed. If you see people that don't, very weak egos, for example, that's tied to self-confidence, for example, as well. They they become weak. They can't function in society. Perhaps they're like, is it the people pleasers or like exactly. the chameleon type personalities and things? Okay, yeah. Interesting take. Final question for you. And then I'm gonna I want you to get, you know, give you a, a, a fair uh, chance to just tell everybody where they can reach out to you. I've really enjoyed this interview today authenticity where does that show up because i'm it's like you got your ego you got your identity somewhere in there how do you know that you're showing up as your authentic self how can you how does it show up in your body your mindset uh what kind of filter i guess what's your definition or your take on being authentic well when you feel good about yourself ooh, that's good like nice that that for me is a simple way because yeah. when i'm feeling authentic i feel good about myself i like myself i love myself um the moments that I don't feel good about myself, I know I haven't been authentic or my behavior hasn't been authentic to myself as a soul, right? Not question, just a human being. Question that comes up for that though, if people are saying, well, I got to, I have to put that aside. I have to get this done as a, you know, I have to keep grinding on my job. I'm not enjoying it, but like I'm putting that aside. How, is, how, how do you, how would you explain that? Because they are, they're not enjoying it. Does that mean they're inauthentic? No, that just means that what they are doing doesn't fit with who they want to be. Ooh, okay. There we go. Got it. Okay. Brilliant. Awesome, dude. I really appreciate you coming on today. If anybody wants to reach out to you, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you and where can we find your book? Yeah, the simplest way is you can connect with me on social media. I'm mainly on LinkedIn, a little bit on Instagram, but my handle is at Pradeep Sangha. Feel free to connect with me, but please um, send put me a message that you've listened to the podcast or whatever so I know. Um, otherwise, get a lot of requests and we don't necessarily accept them all. Um, and if you are interested in the book, you can go to completemanbook.com to go and that'll take you to the Amazon site. If you want the physical copy, if you'd like the audio, um, I can give you a discount code here. So go to completemanaudio.com and that will give you the audiobook and the ebook combo. And if you use the promo code VICTORY75, so the number 75, all together so victory 75 you'll get 75 percent off that wow brilliant thanks so much for that dude i really pleasure. appreciate you coming on the show today all the best to you i i yeah just getting a great vibe from you and everything you're doing so i'm, I'm definitely interested to keep uh keep in touch with you and keep uh tabs on everything that you're doing thank you so much for coming on the show today yeah thanks matt i, I enjoyed it and thank you for having me you bet anytime